right. Well, I'm Matthew Pose. Don was saying. <laughs> and I'm Don Duh. <laughs> With Haven Smart. Yeah. And uh, no, this I'm VP of Technology of Haven Smart. And I'm Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, but this is, of course, Audioholics, and we are here doing our Matt and Don Tech Talk. I haven't been on in a while with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we've both yeah. actually been really, really busy, and we mm -hmm. kept texting each other. we got to get this show going again. We've got people who have messaged us, want to come on. Uh, got a lot lined up, but we thought, why don't we just do kind of like a test run? We'll come on. We'll uh, talk about what, what we have going on, and we'll just you know, wow. get back. We could probably fill a three-hour show with what we got going on together. I mean, we're... So, so Matt and I do several projects and we're going to do several more projects. We're doing some uh, massive stuff we can't really talk about, but it's going to be, it's going to be all over the place when it, when it's ready to go. For sure. Yeah. We, I mean, I think we're lucky we're working on some projects that are, are the kind of things that a lot of people would, would love to have just once in a lifetime. Dream uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's at least two or three just going on right this moment. Certainly there's more more coming and you know unfortunately we get these projects and it's like man we got to put these on audio holics we got to talk about what we're doing this is gonna be really cool people will really like this um you know it gives you out dream opportunities to do stuff you just don't normally get to do because of the budgets mm -hmm. and then of course there's always ndas right so and yeah, we can't talk about the, it pesky ndas pesky we NDAs. So, so tonight we wanted to talk um about something that that i do a lot of and of course matt's kind of getting into it as well from the mechanical side of it to the acoustical side of it is outdoor audio, outdoor audio systems, outdoor video systems, outdoor theater. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're getting into what well, we're springtime now, right? And uh, heading into yeah. summer and everybody wants to do their outdoor sound. And I, of course, I've recently relocated to Florida. So when I lived in Illinois, you get what, two, uh, two months of summer. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so like that, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't have a lot of outdoor sound stuff there it just wasn't a big priority for me i put my money and energy into the inside mm -hmm. so when i built this house i really actually wasn't planning to do anything outside because i didn't before and i didn't see the point and instead right. and i hadn't really ever heard a good outdoor sound system to be honest i had heard mostly the inexpensive kind of commodity junk that you tend to see a lot of and it, it didn't impress me it didn't seem worth the effort you know it's relatively expensive to run wire. So if you're going to run wire and not even use it, that's, that's not a sensible thing. So I didn't I really want to do it. You talked me into it. You said, Matt, you got to at least run wire out there. Be prepared to do it. A stub out or two stub outs. Yeah. The and then we out. actually ran it into the ceiling of, um, I'll actually put, bring up a presentation to show that in a second, but we put it in the ceiling in some of the lanai area there as well. So we could do more and I, all I originally did was some in-ceiling speakers that I Sonance gave them to me to review. They're called like the Extreme Sixes. Yeah, the the Sonance. Speaker. Sonance, they're, yeah. They're great speakers. They're actually built to mill mil specifications, and we use those all the time in our outdoor installations. They sound great, and they do hold up. Yeah, I think I got them because of you. You were. Uh, talking about them they said yeah we you know we we were thinking it'd be good to review this kind of stuff and i will actually do a formal review on them but uh anyway i hooked them up i was just running basically 20 watts to each one it's a it's a juke i think it's called the juke, juke six the juke amp, yeah. yeah yeah that amp it's an it's a multi-zone amp i've got a review coming on that and um it was class really impressed. D, right it's class, class D, D. yeah and i was really impressed it actually had a, a very decent amount of bass uh, coming out of these two six inch drivers that were there. You could play them pretty loud. And so we're hanging out in the pool, we're playing it. And I'm thinking, you know, it's not like the best thing I've ever heard, but it's actually a lot of fun. And then I got from Dayton Audio, one of their 10 inch outdoor subs, and I hooked that up to a 250 watt sub amp and then it's thumping. And I'm like, all right, this is pretty awesome. It's on now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I, you know, I started hearing better and better systems, which we'll talk about. And that I got kind of hooked into this and I thought, you know, this is, this is actually a good market sector. This is a cool area to be into and especially in Florida or any of the warm, warm climates. But yeah, I, I just thought, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about what we're even doing. in the, even in the cold climates. So obviously Florida is a big deal. So one of my specialties as an integrator is uh, listen, I love, two channel sound rooms. I love building theaters more than anything in the planet. I love the sound inside, but the reality is most of us spend a lot of time outside, especially if you have a pool or a fire pit or an area outside. And why not bring that sound and bring that video outside? And so the industry has kind of responded by building literally a cornucopia, for lack of a better term, 
of amazing products. Um, so now we're able to say, if you have a lanai coming off your house, we'll do some in ceiling speakers and those sound great. They concentrate the sound kind of down in the area. We can do just a stereo pair. Usually we do sound reinforcement. So we put multiple speakers. Most CD integrators do that. Um, some great integrators out there and, and spread that sound out, but that sounds kind of contained. Now you can also do speakers up on your kind of the eve and, and on wall speakers and kind of point them out. Um, and they sound great. The problem is they kind of push that sound out into the neighbor's yard. So what we do is we do the flush mount architectural speakers in covered areas. Then we, we take landscape audio and that landscape audio can be a multitude of configurations. Ones are very popular are 10, 12, or even 15 inch subwoofers that bury in the ground and they almost look like a mushroom coming up and they play the sound like, like we did at Gene's. And then they have satellite speakers and those satellite speakers cover a broad area, say around a pool or an outdoor entertainment area with a fire pit, maybe an outdoor grill. And they look like, um, kind of like landscape lighting and those point back towards the house. So I know they play loud and there's a lot of sound out there, but it really, um, it kind of negates how that sound bleeds in other yards a little bit. It really does. Yeah, actually, that was one of the things I started learning as I started playing around with more of this and getting some demos of some of the different types of products and different form factors out there is that outdoor sound is actually really significantly different in how you plan it than indoor sound. Mm -hmm. And as an integrator, you need to know this, but even just as, as the, the DIY guy or, or even just as the person, who the right. consumer who's buying it, you also need to know what you're buying because, Don, you deal with this. You know, if somebody comes to me and says, uh, you know, you need three subwoofers and you need eight speakers in your backyard. I'm probably gonna be like, you know, I don't want to spend that much money. Why do I need eight speakers and three subwoofers? Well, depending on the layout of the yard, that might actually not be even close to overkill. That might be really what's necessary to provide appropriate coverage. And mm -hmm. so it's actually something I'm hoping we can do another presentation on just to get into that. I am sharing now, Don, just so you know, uh, mm -hmm. this is a picture of mine. So you can see mm -hmm. here and here are those architectural speakers. Those are the ones we were talking about down here is that Dayton subwoofer. One of the things about outdoor sound, so when you're inside and you put a subwoofer inside, it reflects off all the walls before your brain even registers. Loads. It, you're getting the loading, but those reflections make it so that the size of it is not directional subwoofer. You can't really tell where it's coming from. It also means that no matter where you place the subwoofer, you're going to hear the bass. There's going to be modes, and that's going to make the response uneven, but you're going to hear the level on average about the same everywhere in the room other than the effect of these modes that's not true outside that's not even close to true instead you get the uh, uh sound basically the closer you are to the sub the louder it is the farther away you get from that subwoofer the quieter it is it's called the inverse square law it's something that sound follows light follows and inside subwoofers don't follow that the main speakers do to a point the subwoofers do not outside both the subwoofers and the main speakers follow that and so what happens ultimately is you need to make sure that you're providing coverage or when you're close to the speakers it's going to be really really loud and when you're away from those speakers it's going to not be very loud and if you don't have like one of the problems with the architectural speakers is it doesn't sound the same when you're way off axis as would be true of any speaker it's just that the the speakers are aimed straight down so when you're sitting at that dining table that you can see there you know, behind the Don and Matt piece here, right there. Mm -hmm. Sound is awesome. It's really good. You know, over here, it's bass heavy because the sub is not really in the best place. I probably should have put it over on the corner here, but I wasn't really thinking. Well, um, I, I think outside, it, it's very clear when you put a sub near a hard surface, a wall, mm -hmm. it, it really it dramatically increases the output, more so yeah. than you notice inside of a house. It's funny how that works. Well, it's because when it's inside, you are always getting some loading. When it's outside, mm -hmm. you're not. So the moment you right. do that, you're getting the benefit of that loading. Yeah, in fact, I probably am going to have uh, uh, the wire rerun so I can put the subwoofer over in that corner. And then the plan would be to put two more speakers up here. And then let me show you guys some more. Turn this off really quick. All right. So then this is the other part of my yard here. And this is what you were talking about, Don. So um, mm -hmm. this is my pool. And in that picture you saw, you could see these chairs that are here. Let me get that laser pointer back because why not make this a nerdy. So we would normally bring those wires out along the backside of that pool. Yeah. So you, the landscaping so, and, and fire those in. 
And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to run the wires out here and then right here in the back where the landscaping is, we're going to put in those speakers. They look just like lights. They're just what, four times bigger. <laughs> they're much bigger because they have, to, I right. mean, they typically come in either, they, they do come in a range of sizes. I guess there's some that are as small as maybe there's, two and a half, three the inches. Satellites, there's, there's a, usually a four inch, a six inch, in, 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 or an eight inch even. With some yeah, eight inch is not uncommon. Yeah. That I just got a demo of the eight inch ones from uh, Ambisonics, which is mm -hmm. one of the high end outdoor sound companies. Mm -hmm. They sounded awesome. They were huge though. When the guy brought them out, I was like, man, I can't imagine putting those in the yard. But once they yeah, were but once snuck you them in, you don't notice yeah. them. Yeah. That's exactly right. And he, he did. Know. He stuck them back in there. And I was like, you know, you wouldn't see those pushed back. Not so as much the, at least. The acoustics outdoors are, are definitely something that I mean, most people just take them and place them wherever, but we try to take a little bit of effort and where we're going to, we, we try to do a diagram, map it out where we're going to have these systems so that they're discreet, they sound great, and they focus the sound back towards the house. Because, you know, people are out enjoying, they, they may have a projector, which is something that we do. You know, they may have the, all their friends with their kids come over and hang out and they want to have good, even sound where they're, wherever they're at. And the only way to do that is to have a multitude of speakers. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do want to mention actually some, there's, there's a lot of, I think, debate because I talk to a lot of the different guys that work for these companies that actually deal with doing the uh, outdoor sound. Uh, so integrators really should know their stuff well enough to be able to design the outdoor space. But a lot of the companies that we would purchase from have people on staff where that's their job. So you could go to them and send them the yard plan and say, I need a design plan for your speakers. And then they actually have, uh, in some cases, specialized software they can use for you, makes your job a little bit easier, especially if you don't know what you're doing and they wanna make sure ultimately both you and the company selling speakers wanna make sure clients are happy with the end results. So that's why sure. they offer these services. Well, so, so I've been, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, uh, there's, there's a multitude of systems. Um, there's very simple systems that we use. Some of them are 70 volt because of the distances involved. But as you're starting to learn, there are some really serious high output, high fidelity systems that that turn your backyard into a rock concert. I mean, you're, yeah. you're starting to see that now. Well, I mean, we've been promoting crazy big subwoofers for years. We've been into high output speakers. You've got Gene's system is very high output. Lots of subs. My system mm -hmm. is as well. My system isn't hooked so up at the mine. moment, but will be. So is um, mine. Your system. Yeah, that's true. Your system is very high. But what, four, four 18s you have? 418s and 412s. Yeah, 418s yeah, and 412s. So that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty modest system right there. Yeah, and uh, and so I think a lot of people see that kind of stuff and they don't think of outdoor as being like that. But actually, outdoor kind of needs that more. It's just where you're going to stick all the equipment and the cool where thing. Where you live. Them. Yeah. I mean, well, if you got, if you have neighbors that will tolerate it well, and you've yeah, got the that... space. And you've got the space for it. I mean, you and I have talked about this one. Jane's uh, loudspeaker is one of the companies that makes some pretty cool mm -hmm. outdoor stuff. They do mm -hmm. high, high output, good sound. They have a mm -hmm. 21 inch burial subwoofer, like 21 inch sub you bury in the ground. All you see is a little mushroom. It's not that little actually, pretty sizable mm -hmm. mushroom. Looks like a well cover, um, but it's a 21 inch sub. I mean, I would love to put two of those in my yard. Yeah. Um... Sonance bought James Loudspeaker, so they're one company now. And I, I got to tell you, they make some absolutely amazing outdoor from mild to wild. And I mean wild, like crazy. You can have a backyard that plays 120, 130 dBs. Realistically, you really can. Uh, I've done yeah. some outrageous. Yeah, I've done some outrageous outdoor systems. You know, you I did do, a, um, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you can do a full on rock concert levels with some of the oh, stuff yeah. they sell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So people just don't realize, I mean, it's so much fun to have a really great outdoor system. Now I know in Florida, people spend a lot of time outside, but you know what? People spend time outside in, you know, Utah. I mean, you know, we wow. were in Montana, yeah. we're hanging out on a grill and they yeah. had, you know, I was out there in October. So, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are. You know, having great sound outside is a, a ton of fun and, and video as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we should talk actually more about the video side. I know, mm -hmm. Um, you and I deal with uh, essentially weatherproofed TVs from various brands and have gotten familiar mm -hmm. with some of the options and, and what mm -hmm. matters and what doesn't. And I know a lot of people like to put TVs. In fact, here in Florida, again, because people are outside so much, probably half or more of my friends have TVs outside. I mean, I'm not talking about people. They're not wealthy people with high end systems. They're average Joes. They just like yeah. to watch the news, but they stuck the TV out there because 
again, here people spend so much time outside. It's pretty normal for somebody to, to take their coffee, for instance, every morning outside, get yep. their news that way, get their basketball game that way, whatever yep. it is they're into. And, uh, you know, there, most people actually buy, I think Gene does this too. They buy just kind of off the shelf TVs that are designed for indoor use and stick them out there. And then once they die, they replace well, them. So there's some problems with that. You definitely there are. can do that. You can definitely do that. In Florida, it's not going to last. I mean, it's just not going to last that long. The humidity um, and then things like hurricanes, especially like well, if you well, saw. Right. Well, go ahead. So, so one of the problems is that those TVs are not UL rated to be outside. So yeah. if you did have a problem like a fire or whatnot, it, 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 imagine something happened and your house burns down and then they use that as a loophole not to pay you for it. Versus if you buy like a Sunbright or a Samsung outdoor TV or um, Peerless makes some. I mean, there's a few companies that make outdoor yeah, TVs. Yeah, C-Lock is another one. Right. They're specifically designed. They have different models. They have ones that like the Veranda series from Sunbright is designed to go up under an area that's covered that has a little bit of light, you know, light control on it. Then they make TVs that you could put out by the pool and you could run a hose on them. You know what I mean? And they, and they have a ton of nits. So they have a crazy anti-reflective screen and a lot of brightness on them. So you yeah. literally can watch them during the day. So, I mean, it really is depends on what you want to do in your budget. Yeah. I'm probably going to be putting a peerless one out here, which is really more access and budget. Mm -hmm. You know, they make a decent priced one that I can get. Uh, but Samsung, they have a terrace line and they have specifically in the terrace line, uh, one that's designed for direct sunlight that I honestly mm -hmm. believe is the best outdoor TV money can buy. Um, it's yeah, brighter peerless? than most of the, not, not from peerless from Samsung. Yeah. It's a good TV. I've, I've got, Two of them going in projects right now. Yeah, I mean, so the issue with a lot of the other ones from companies like Peerless and Sea Lock, and there's there's a bunch of these companies, uh, even Sunbright, is that they don't make their own panels. So they're buying panels from other companies and using them. And what that means is they have to kind of work with what they can get. Now, companies like Sunbright actually does a lot of customization of those panels to make them work yeah. better, and they do have Sunbright's our main line. Yeah, yeah, and they're good. They're good TVs. They're well made. And they last well outside for sure. Mm -hmm. But the Samsung Terrace was built from the ground up, every component to be an ideal outdoor TV. And they have different ones. There's a lower end one that's so so, yeah. but they have a top of the line one that I, I had seen. And it's, would, it's would they have bright. one that's designed for um, verandas under uh, underneath the yeah. eyes? Then they have one like like Sunbright does that's designed for being outside that has a much higher brightness on it. But I mean, you're for a 65 or a 75, you're like 10 grand. Yeah, ten grand. I, mean, I think that is a price. Right, it's a lot of money. Yeah. So I've got one that's being installed now that actually pop comes out of the. There's an outdoor kitchen, and it comes out of the outdoor kitchen, then turns, and it's got a sound bar on it, so you have good sound that comes from it. Samsung actually makes a outdoor powered sound bar for it, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, and I think Sunbright, Peerless, some of the other companies, they also have sound bars that go with them. But then a lot of the companies we deal with, Origin Acoustics, Sonon, mm -hmm. also make sound bars you can put outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I think James does as well. So I just wanted to Absolutely. show this picture from the beginning again. So right, oh my God, you guys can't see my yeah, got a laser printer again. This is actually where my TV hookup is. So that would be where it would go. And you can see that's an exposed area. So I have to have an outdoor mm -hmm. TV there. Uh, putting an indoor TV there is, is not going to last. You know, it just... Any, so, any reasonable rainstorm is going to hit that thing. And then I have a projector mount actually up here, but we, we haven't, I need, I need, we're going to, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to yeah, that. Yeah, we, we got to, I need to get a projector for that area. So, so Matt, what would you say about if you're building a house about wiring it when in doubt? Overwire it. So overwire the, I was yeah. saying earlier, wiring is expensive, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not. So it's one of those things where if you're, if you're really looking at every penny you're spending it adds up and it looks expensive and you're like oh man when the house is done and you look back on it it's going to range anywhere from it can't be done to it's going to be four or five times more expensive yep. to do it so like in my house one of the things i didn't do and i wish i had was I, I wish i had run fiber optic to each of my drops and the reason for that is that had i run fiber optic it would have given me or, more options uh, than using hd base t for doing distributed video and the HG, at, a, at a substantial expense, though. Well, yeah, I mean, I was lucky in that I was actually offered uh, enough spools of the fiber optic cable to do it at no cost, but um, but didn't because I wasn't, to be honest, well, there still would have been a cost in the fact that I would have had gotten hardware that converts the fiber lines over to whatever it is I need it to be. That's actually pretty expensive right now still. Um, you would know better. Are your guys pretty good with fiber? That was one of my worries was well, I wasn't yeah, sure how experienced they were. Yeah, pretty easy now. 
Um, here's the problem. There's no real kind of standard for fiber. I mean, there's single mode, multi-mode, and, and we've talked about this before. Listen, I would love to, and we just did the Haven Smart, um, ultimate smart home. I mean, we, we've literally wired um, my boss's house, <laughs> but to, I'm telling you, there's no house that I could think of for it's 6,000 square foot to have as, as much wire as this. And we did run fiber to all the locations. So the problem is, is that fiber is great, but everything that uses fiber is exponentially more expensive. It is. Yeah. Now, one of the things, though, that you can do that I isn't it's another thing that I probably should have done. I know Gene did this after the fact. I can't do it after the fact because of the construction of my house. And that was running fiber based HDMI. So they make sure. pre done. And I know the, the one that's from HD. What's the company that you guys work with? Remind me. For, for uh, AV Pro Edge. AV Pro Edge. What? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and then they have a, a, a line of fiber optic uh, mm -hmm. HDMI. Bullet train. They're bullet, bullet train. They're bullet, right. they're bullet train HDMI cables are, we found to be the finest cables out there. And we, and we do a lot of HDMI cables. We do probably thousands of them, to be honest with you, between our two locations a year. And they make a fantastic product, but they do make a, an active fiber optic base cable up to a hundred meters. Yeah. So the other thing in my house that I learned, so I, I trusted Gene and we, or Gene, I, sorry, I trusted Don, did not trust Gene. I trusted Don and did, did first mistake. <laughs> and, and did a lot of the wiring, although I did nix a lot of it on you just to save money, which I probably right. shouldn't have done. But one of the things oh, that I, yeah, one of the things I did keep was I, I made sure that there was a couple of drops in the ceiling for access points. And the original plan was to have two because I thought the house is actually not that big. The house is 2,635 square feet. So it's not a huge house. Um, and 635 of it are on the second floor and then around 2,000 of it are on the main floor. And so my thinking was, oh, come on, that's not a very big house. How could I possibly need more than two access points? I shouldn't even need more than one access point, but I'll have two. It should be good to go. Well, we installed the two access points. And I had a lot of dead spots, including yeah. I didn't really think about it at the time, but like all my pool equipment, for instance, is Wi-Fi based. A lot of the other stuff that's outside that's, you know, my sprinkler system, all that right. Wi-Fi based. Yeah. I didn't think about 4. that. Most of that yeah. is 2.4, 4, most of the stuff inside is 5G. And listen, it just doesn't have the range of 2.4. You it have didn't. to have multi multiple access points and some kind of router or control system that controls it. Yeah. I know there's a lot of mesh network stuff, but it's just not the same as having hardwired access points. Even if you go something cheap like Ubiquity, it's still better than having, you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I ended up which, going which Netgear Pro, 3, 000, which I know. What'd you say? 3,000 square foot? Is that what you're at? 35? Two, uh, two, 2,635. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, not, not 3000. We actually intentionally, our last house was bigger than this house. Um, and we had a lot of, we had like bedrooms we never used, like literally just keeping them clean was an issue because they never got used. So they would just get dusty. And when we built this house, I was like, I don't want any rooms we don't need. Like it just was such a waste. Seems silly. So we made the rooms we like bigger and we just got rid of rooms we didn't want. This was a custom designed house, you know, that we cool. kind of built to our needs. Oh, I wish you had more pictures. Your house well, is pretty badass, dude. I, I love your house. It's very I appreciate that. Super it's, cheap and contemporary. It's very nice. So it was a dream for us. Um, and I will say for those who wonder, uh, reviewing for Audio Helix, I had nothing to do with being able to pay for this house. <laughs> we took a lot of hard work with my <laughs> oh, actual <no>. job <laughs> to be able to no, get there. And so no, we did, no. we did, we, we saved our pennies and we relocated and we built our dream home. I've always wanted to be in a modern home. Mid-century stuff has always been something I was big on. And Sarasota is actually famous for their mid-century architecture and yep. the core house. I mean, we modified it to get the house we wanted the way we wanted it, but the core house was actually originally designed by a very famous uh, architect from that period. Um, he, he's, he's, he was probably like a draftsman in the, let's say sixties when the, the height of Sarasota's building, but then he became an architect later on and designed this. I think he's retired at this point. Um, and then we took one of his designs and modified it. So anyway, um, so a couple things. First off, somebody, um, let me see if I can show this. Here we go. Nightjar Ubiquity, asked. Ubiquity is really cheap. Yeah. Uh, so Nightjar asked, he says he's relocating to uh, Tampa and he wants to know what the houses are like and if the weather's unbearable. So I've only been here, not even a full two years, uh, although we were vacationing here quite a bit, which is part of why we moved. Don, you've been here, what, your whole life or most of your life? No, your but, life. Uh, many, yeah, I mean, I've been here since the late seventies. Look, Tampa is a great town, man. You yeah. Look me up when you hit, hit Tampa. 
Um, you know, it's hot. I mean, but shit, it's hot everywhere in the summer. It's just the winters are just spectacular here. Like, well, like half the country was getting hundred degree weather, and we were in the eighties and comfortable. It never breaks. It never breaks a hundred in, in, in Tampa or Sarasota. It, I don't think it ever has broken a hundred. So, I mean, it's just hot a long time, and it's really humid. But yeah, that's what they make air conditioners for it, man. You know. So anyway, for those who are curious, um, you can definitely build houses here. They have. Uh, tons and tons of new construction going on just because this is probably one of the number one states for growth right now you know, where a lot of people are moving. If anything, it's yeah. a shortage of yeah. homes, which makes it expensive and everything takes longer than it should because of yeah. COVID. And, and used to not be expensive. It was pretty cheap to live down here, but yeah. 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 My area is crazy. Now it used to be even when we, I mean, our house doubled in value between when we built it and paid for it and when we actually moved in. So that's to me, that's completely bonkers if that's what was going on. Anyway, let's keep going with this. Yeah. Going back in the subject is, is, you know, outdoor systems. I mean, there's, there's so many products available to do. I mean, we've even done um, underwater speakers in pools, which yeah, is yeah. actually really trippy. In and fact, one of the cool projects that we're doing together, I sent uh, to the mm -hmm group that we're working with that I sent links to one of the products that's used for that, uh, which is mm -hmm. uh, Clark synthesis, I think is the name of the company right. and they make mm -hmm. a speaker and the way it works is, is it looks and is based on the same technology as their tactile transducers. But in this right. case, it's a right. full range speaker. It vibrates the water basically, and you can hear the sound in the water. And the way it works is it goes into a, a lighthouse a, a housing that would normally be used for like an led light. So in my pool, you can't see it, but, um, basically on the part of it, you can't see there's a large light. It's about eight inches in diameter, it changes color and puts on, it has a party mode to it, plays to the music. That housing that that light goes into, which in my case is from Pentair, which is like one of the top brands for this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. You actually buy basically an empty Pentair light housing and you put the speaker inside of it and they make a cover for it. And so from the outside, it just looks like a light but it's actually wired up as a speaker. And the neat thing you can do with it is you can make it so that when you're above the water, you hear your sound because you've got the sound you know, the speakers around the pool. When you swim underwater, it doesn't like stop or get muffled. You still hear it. You know, it's not exactly the same sound quality, but basically as clear as you did when you were above the water. So it's a really cool concept. Um, it's not super cheap. It's something that you absolutely have to plan for ahead of time. Like you can see my whole pool deck is concrete. So if I wanted to put it in, how am I gonna get speaker wire in there? Yeah, so, that would be nearly impossible. Well, I mean, you got good sound going all the way around it. So I'm not too worried about it. It's, it's pricey, but for those who can afford it or who want to jump in on something like that, it is, it's a pretty cool idea. So do you have the pictures of Gene's outdoor area? Cause he's got, some I really do. Well, I, I have a couple slides still from some other okay. stuff and sure. then I'm going to okay. jump in. Right on. Roger that. All right. So this is, you, you've seen this, I think, half functioning before. I don't know if you've been over since it's I've been seen it functioning. Done. Yeah. All right. So this is my family room. I just wanted to show people because there's a whole review coming uh, around this. So this is the Sony, what was it? A80J, I think it is. 77, OLED. 77 inch. Yeah. OLED TV. It's, uh, it's awesome. And uh, that's what we did in there. Uh, then the speakers there are, are definitive technology. It's dual I think it's dual six and a half inch mid base drivers with a one inch aluminum dome tweeter. I think it's mm -hmm. called like 6.5 LCR. So there's going to be a full review on that. And you can, I mean, you can see them in the picture, but they, I think they blend in pretty good. I think that worked out really well. Mm -hmm. That's real marble there. That was like one of our little upgrades that I really, my wife was not into this, but I was like, it's going to be so cool. And then we waited like four months just to get the marble. So it, just to talk on that for a minute, as an integrator, this is kind of a representation of a lot of what we do, we have to do so we do a lot of surround systems in family rooms. Then then they usually have like a media room or or a theater room separate from that. But when we do these kind of rooms, we have to hide the products. And here's yeah. an example. You have what a five two two? Is that is that right? Or a seven two two? Five two two, that's right. So there was okay. no room in this place. You can kind of see in the picture why that's true. I mean, there's lots of things here that people would see. Um where I think their argument would be, why did you do it that way, Matt? You know better, you know, things were placed in the wrong place, but Don, you know, it doesn't matter if you know better. There's you have you're dealing to, with reality. You have all to time. make compromises. Yep. And and listen, all the do-it-yourselfers and internet trained home theater experts, 
will tell you, oh, my God, I can't believe you put that center channel there. Look, you ain't going to hear the damn difference. And most people aren't, especially in a family room. Dude, I'm so yeah. sick of this. You know what I mean? It, it, how does your family room sound? Does it work great for what you need it for? It's super impressive. Every time people come over, they can't believe that it sounds as good as it does. Yeah, and I have, obviously, a dedicated theater. So if I want like the best sound, that's where I go. This was meant to be something that you can just basically, it's, like, it's got a control for system on it. So it's set up so my wife can grab the remote. She wants to watch whatever it is she wants to watch, puts it on. She's cool with it. I've had you know friends over. They want me to turn it up and put on Star Wars. That seems to be the one everybody wants to hear. Yeah. Loud. And, uh, and it, yeah, it turn it up. Great. It yeah. does. It does. And you can't really tell that that center is in the wrong location. And in this you, case, you, if I had put it in the right location, there was two problems. It, it would have looked was, like shit. Yeah. It would have looked a little funny. The TV would have been too high. And that was my biggest right. concern is I wanted it to be comfortable to view the TV. My wife cares less about the sound. Um, she does. Right, care there's on the people other hand on here that can't even see the speakers right yeah. now with the picture. No, it's true. I mean, and that's as integrators. Oh, when you walk what, in the room, you can't tell. People actually miss it a lot. And I have to point it out. So, so for those who can't oh, tell. I, there's the left speaker, the center, right. the right one's hidden over there. Really? What's going on, Don? No, I'm just talking over you. Sorry. Oh, all right. And then this is the back. So that's the back surround. So you were asking me if I had five or seven base channels. It's mm -hmm. only five because there was no, there's no sidewalls. <laughs> It's just a big long room, so there was no place to put them. I actually figured it would be worse to stick them in the ceiling, and so I just did Atmos on the ceiling. Yeah, and those um, two big tubs in the ceiling. Yeah, those are, are two big tubs. Right? They're in the wall, but they're up at the top. That's yeah. also kind of goofy, but it has absolutely no effect on the sound. And it was done because the other side of this is a bathroom, and there's plumbing there, so we couldn't put the subs in the wall because it would have hit the plumbing. So I just yeah. put them above the plumbing. I mean, there's just so many misconceptions out there about what you have to do to have good sound. I mean, how cool is it to have a room where people come in and have to look for the speakers, then you fire up Star Wars or whatever. I mean, is it going to sound as good as a dedicated, acoustically treated two-channel room? No, of course not. But I mean, it, it's super slick because it's part of your home and you still got great sound and you got great picture. And that's what we do. And most people don't give a shit about having the perfect location and acoustically transparent screen. They just want it to look good and sound good. I mean, that's the bottom line. And that room's beautiful. Yeah, it worked out really well. And I had never done this for myself before. I've installed in-wall speakers for other people. Uh, but this wasn't something that I had been all that into. I'd always had um, some sort of dedicated space, whether it was an extra bedroom or something that I had put. And I always had good in-room speakers. And so to me, this was like, oh, you don't do that. But in this case, I had the opportunity, um, you know, technology uh well really sound united sponsored this whole project yeah, sound united was great yeah. they were they were really they were very generous and you know this was kind of a once in a lifetime because for them they can't get these products reviewed typically just because people aren't it, you know you've had to deal with this someone comes to you and says hey don we want your company to start selling our product here's some in-wall speakers and your response mm -hmm. is cool i'm not going to cut my wall open for this Right. So that's that's an issue with reviewers as well. People aren't going to cut their walls open to put something in, especially if they have to send it back. So what we said so, to them was, you know, we're going to wire up for it if you're willing to give us the speakers. And they said, sure. Yeah, let's do the review. So you guys got to know this is a sponsored review. You can say I'm biased as a result of that. But I would just argue sounds that. good. Biases. Who cares? Yeah. It sounds really good, dude. I've heard it. It does sound good. I mean, um, I'll tell her how it is, too. I, yeah. I've i always been I mean, that way. You won't. You don't pull punches, Pose. But. Just well, Gene and I, a few years ago, before we started building his new home, I mean, we had really candid conversations about, listen, let's explore what you can do and expand audioholics from just bookshelf and tower speakers and subwoofers, which I love as much as you do, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but into architectural stuff and landscape audio. And we've really tried to do that, A, with the project building his house and now building your house and talking about some of these things like outdoor audio systems. These just bring enhancement to people's lives and, and they save marriages. You know, yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. They really do. Like, again, there's actually a lot of truth room, to that one. Yeah. You go in that room, you got this beautiful fireplace below this marble. Um, was it difficult to install a marble? No, because we gave the exact dimensions to the marble guys and had them with specialized tools cut the marble and behind the TV, correct? So I'm going to say yes and no, because Don didn't actually see the struggles that went into it. <laughs> um, and his guys only experienced about a third of the struggle. So here's here's the reality. Yeah, if you're going to do this, uh, unless you've got a, a 
proper cutting equipment you need to cut mm -hmm. through marble. And, and I'll just say like those slabs are very, very expensive. They're not just hard, expensive. You, you, this is a book matched slab. You can see that in the picture, which means that they split a slab. If you crack one of those slabs, you have to start over. Oh, yeah, and they don't have those sitting around at a warehouse. Literally, this was when I ordered these, I went to a warehouse that had marble and I said, this is what I want. I need it. I don't need really thick because it's getting clad onto a basically on drywall. Um, so they were trying to sell me two inch slabs and I said, I don't need that. So they got me, I think it was one inch or one, one and a quarter inch or something like that, which was the thinnest they could do. They didn't have that in stock. That wasn't a common thing that was stocked. Sure. And so what they did was they had to order it from the source, which literally I didn't know this about marble. Marble largely comes from Italy. And so they ordered it from Italy where it then had to be sent over to China, where most marble is processed, most stone in general is processed because of what was going on. It sat in China for a while. Then it sat in the port of Miami for a while, then eventually came over here where my installer marble installer, not Don's guys had to cut it on a computerized, I mean, basically like a CNC machine and they cut everything out, but it was kind of a rough cut. So they cut it so it was laid out and ready to go in. But once it was in, they had to bring their tools in to get those openings just right for the speaker. So I, I had the speakers on hand. Everything was ready to go. We used pre-construction brackets that ultimately we actually had to remove because the problem we ran into was that the oh, marble plus thick. drywall was too thick. Too thick, yeah. And those dog ears wouldn't grab it. So we ended up, ended up having to be creative to get the dog ears to grab. But we did. We got it all functioning correctly and it, and it did work out but yeah installing a marble is not easy this was a tricky way to do it not for um, the faint of heart yeah i have a pro do it um night jar said you know he likes having a dedicated room uh, and doesn't like having a dedicated, doesn't like a dedicated room. room yeah like my room my family room's an open platform room and it rocks i mean it sounds yeah. amazing that most sounds great so i don't think you're limited by that um and and it goes to james's question um, can you have Atmos in an open concept living room? You absolutely can. In some yeah, ways, that most in this better. Room. Yeah, in some ways, it sounds better because you just it's more spacious. I mean, you get a lot of reflection that you don't in a dedicated and a treated room, and that's just the truth. Like like you've heard Gene's room, his 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 family room rocks, man. It sounds amazing. Of course, he's got absolutely. pro listeners in there. Now. Yeah, yeah, he's got really so, good speakers in there. He yeah, the person S seventeen. So yep. yeah, you you don't have to have a dedicated room to get killer sound you just have to be smart about what you do and not yeah. not all in ceiling or in wall speakers suck there's a lot of them that are really true high fidelity speakers and great um to use in as an atmos or a um, front effect speaker absolutely and one of the things that i don't think always was true but it's more true today than it's ever been so companies like perlison which i happen to sell uh calf is another company rbh um ever Everybody. trying to think of some other ones Focal. james actually would be their focal yeah they sell yeah. very high-end home theater specific in-wall speakers and these are not a comp they used to be that doing in-wall was a compromise over well they're speakers. box speakers that are designed to go on the wall exactly like the the uh, perlison actually has an s7t but it's an in-wall so it's an s7i mm -hmm. it is the same speaker there's no difference they mm -hmm. just put it in a in a box that goes in the wall well there's a little difference in the crossover because it, where it's going to be mounted you know focal focal's 1000 series or 300 series come to mind they absolutely sound amazing yeah you know so so at this point in time you can do a thx rated high output home theater and have it all be hidden and you could do it in a room like this i didn't for this particular space and you know there's a, there would be a cost and and so for me that didn't make sense and i have a dedicated room but for those who don't like having a dedicated space because it is isolating my wife hates it i'm i'm one of those people I, I'm I'm relatively introverted most of the time outside of my show with Don here. And so one of the ways that I recharge is actually to go be by myself to listen to music. So I like yeah, the, eight, the eight seconds a day you get to be by yourself. Yeah, well, that's right. true. I haven't been able to yeah. do that much. But when I do so, get to recharge. Reggie asked a question. He's like, he asked about Coastal Source or Ambisonic. Look, man, Coastal Source makes great speakers. I haven't heard their new ribbon ones. Um, I'm sure they're great, but Coastal Source has always made, if you like that style and how they sit, um, I'm a big James loudspeaker fan. We do a lot of the high output James stuff outdoors and, and also, um, Sonance, but I got to tell you this new Ambisonic stuff, man, it's the guy that started James speakers originally that basically invented half the shit we sell outside or inside. Um, the, the Ambisonic stuff's impressive. You just heard it. 
I did. Yeah. And I was familiar with the company. I didn't know a lot about it. I knew they used a planner tweeter. It looked interesting. I know they were using pretty good drivers, but I didn't know a lot about it. It turns out they're using Fatal Pro drivers for their mid-base drivers and their subwoofer drivers. So those, For those who don't know, that's an Italian company that makes really good pro audio drivers. They handle a lot of power. They're very linear, very low distortion. I mean, these are high fidelity drivers by any standard. And then the tweeter they use is custom to them, but it's a, it's a high output planner tweeter that really is more like those uh, high output tweeters, the planner ones that are used in pro audio than, than no, home they're audio, crazy loud, man. They're... which allows them to play crazy loud. And then the crossovers are pretty overkill, even their 70 volt transformer. So a lot of people hear 70 volt. Well, some of you may be saying, I have no idea what that is. Basically what it does is it holds the voltage constant at 70 volts. And what that does mm -hmm. is let you use thinner speaker wire or the same speaker wire. Restaurants, malls, distances. Yeah, everybody most, uses big, most big environments that have speakers are so 70 volts. You would never use it in a high fidelity system typically. And the reason you wouldn't is that it has to go through a transformer and that transformer, mm -hmm. uh, I'll get there. Hold on. It, it can compromise <laughs> the sound quality, but that's not automatically true. The reason why that's true is most of the transformers that go into these speakers are junk. But companies like Ambisonics actually uses a toroidal transform. It's very high quality, wide bandwidth. And so it doesn't really affect the sound quality mm. all that much. In fact, they'll actually happily challenge you. They'll hook up one speaker as an 8 ohm and, one, and the other one, which bypasses the transformer. And then they hook the other one up as a 70 volt. And they'll switch between the two and defy you to be able to tell the difference. And I haven't done that test with them yet, but I, I don't have doubt after seeing the transformer that that's potentially true. So anyway, you're right, Don. It's it doesn't really affect the sound as much as you think. Yeah. And in this outdoor stuff, yeah. you got bigger issues than the sound quality. Well, depending on how loud you want to play it. A lot of times we'll do a hybrid system where we'll do the satellites 70 volt, then we'll run like 12 gauge direct burial wire to and put like a 2500, like I did at uh, an NFL Hall of Fame player's house. I did. I, he had the 15 inch uh, Sonance. We ran a, we bridged an amp to it at like 2,500 watts. Now I know we're going to get some signal loss over distance, but you got to do what you got to do, brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, One of the issues is those transformers can actually, so if you, some of those, sound, like the Ambisonic subwoofers and some of the James subwoofers, I'm sure there's others like this, but I don't know of a lot like I, that. Even uh, so, Revel. So, cl Clips, Revel. Well, they, they make stuff, but most of those top out about 250, 300 watts. Some yeah. of the stuff from James and from Ambisonic will handle a thousand watts. It's real. Oh, yeah, high they, got, they stuff. got the big baller, you know, throw it on the table. We'll see what you got. I mean, I did a pool um, for the owner of Copper Tail Brewery. It's an excellent beer, by the way. Um, a few years ago, we did like $75,000 where the audio around his pool, man. And it, it sounded like a freaking rock concert. And you couldn't yeah. see it because it was all buried in the landscaping. Which I think really that's cool. the fun. The most fun I've been having actually with this house, with all this stuff is the fact that you can get such good sound and not see it because yeah. you said earlier it can save a marriage. So I, I want to be clear. There's no marriage issues. My wife and I love each other very much, but she does <laughs> absolutely hate this electronics. When we yeah, built the house, can. she didn't want it. She basically said, you get your room upstairs. We're spending a bunch of money on that room. That's it. I don't want to see any stuff anywhere else. And then I started sneaking stuff into the house. <laughs> It, it was all free. That was why. That was what I told her. I'm like, well, we're not paying for it. Time. So, and, and Don, he sold me on the control four system, which was not free. I had to pay for that. And yeah. he said, we're going to do that. We'll program it. And don't you worry, you'll have one remote. It controls everything. It'll be yeah. super simple. And she gave Don a hard time. She was like, it better. And she does. She hates the multi remote thing. Most of my systems in the past typically had like the Logitech remotes that you could program that would control everything, but they worked yeah. half the time. So I had to have all the other remotes out just in case yeah. she could never figure out how to turn anything on. Yeah. She, she's awesome. She's just busy raising kids and take, you know, take care of business, man. You know what I mean? For Her sure. Super cool. But so yeah, anyway, she, doesn't want, she doesn't want to have to, she's not she a nerd like it. we are. She don't want to have to learn how to use it, you know? She didn't want to learn how to use the equipment. She didn't want to see any of it. She didn't want the kids to be able to knock stuff on themselves. She didn't want it out in the room taking up space. That, as, as I said before, the house is not huge. So we have a big couch in that family room. The family room is modest sized. Had we had speakers like Gene does, it would have taken up a lot of walking space there. Anybody has speakers like Gene does, he's going to yeah. kill me. But... They're crazy. So anyway, 
Well, we can keep going with this, though. You would, I know there's a lot of people asking questions. By the way, somebody had asked what kind of speaker gauge I used. I think 14.2 uh, is probably fine for most installs. I'll just say yeah, I did 12.2 and 12.4 in my house with 14.4 in the ceiling. So all the ceiling stuff was done with 14.4. And we did it in a couple of ways. Integrators do this a lot. So if you run 14.4, you don't necessarily have to run two runs to do stereo. In my case, we no. did that in some rooms. We ran four conductor. Yeah. Yeah, four conductor so that you could do stereo that way. However, in the family room here and in the bedroom, I believe it was, we actually ran the 14.4 as if it was for stereo pairs. And those speaker wires me, didn't require batteries, right? No, <laughs> no battery system. So, anyway, it gave me an extra set. And the reason why I did that, which is coming in handy now, was if in the future, so one of the things about in-ceiling speakers is even the best of them don't have a ton of bass. I mean, they're, they're not bad, but they're not. They're they not like back boxes. Or... They're okay, but if they don't have back boxes, they're free air. Yeah, they. Yeah. I mean, you know. It but is you can add is. a subwoofer, and because I ended up running the extra wire, I can put a subwoofer in now. So one of the things that I've been kind of playing around with is the fact that you know it just doesn't have as much bass as I'm used to because typically I do have subwoofers in my system. So like in the bedroom, I have speakers over the bed. I'm probably going to be adding a in ceiling subwoofer to go along with those in the bed and the bathroom same thing putting a box subwoofer in the bathroom would be a little bit weird so we're going to put one up in the ceiling and i just happen to have some extra speaker wire runs up there that we didn't end up using that i'll, I'll use to power the subs so alex said he just bought some focal 100 series icw8 you know alex those are actually really good speakers man the focal 100 series is their entry level product but it sounds better than a lot of companies mid to high level product. So you should enjoy those a lot. They're really great speakers. Yeah. I, my main speakers in the past actually were the Kabuki, Kabuki speakers. Yeah, I have no idea what Kabuki speakers are. Um, they were the focal, um, focal, what was it? The, uh, Utopia, I forget the model now, but the one I told you about, it was the dual five and a quarter inch mid base drivers. Yeah. 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 Oh titanium yeah. Tweeter in the middle that they used to, the company was called JM labs back then. And, and Focal was actually the driver line. They, they rebranded themselves so that everything was Focal, but I know you've, I actually haven't been listening to the stuff other than it shows much since I got rid of those, but I always liked them. I didn't get rid of them for any other reason than they didn't play loud enough for me. And I blew them up. I told you that's yeah, well, you blew, yeah, you, <laughs> that was really the reason. So I, for those yeah. who are wondering what blew them up meant, I don't mean I turned them up too loud and blew them up. That would be pretty hard to do. Uh, I had a lightning storm where lightning actually hit right adjacent to the house and it went through the ground line and actually went back into the house and, and it was a crazy event, but there was actually like a char mark on my wall where the lightning had followed the wire from the outside to the inside. And then you could see if it also went down It ended up blowing my amplifiers, my receiver, all of my speakers, every TV in the house. When the insurance company got the bill, it was something like 50 or $60,000. And they were like, no, they actually had to come over and see all the equipment because they couldn't believe that anybody could possibly have that. And as you know, that's not even that much equipment. We deal with people no. way more than that. So, what people might not know is all of the family audioholics like Teo and, and Matt and I and Gene and I, like we spend hours just talking about all the shit we've owned and all the audio products over the years and what we liked and what we didn't. I mean, that, that we live this like it's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, we 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 do it. I do it for a living anyways, but we we actually reminisce about all these products and we test a lot of stuff. And I mean, you're getting a lot of horsepower when we talk to you guys, we're, we're just trying to be real with you. You know what I mean? For sure. All right. Well, I said, we'd get into this. Let's talk about some other versions of this. So this is the clip system that Gene that's has. That's his front yard. <laughs> that's his front yard. I actually yeah. don't know why he did that, but I guess that's I what do, he wanted. I talked him into it. Listen, what's cooler than having Christmas, Christmas music playing uh, that's that's fair or, that's or, fair. or Halloween, you know, ooh, spooky music. I mean, it's just cool to have. I do them on front porches. We're in landscaping, and I'm like, Gene, since we're building the ultimate audio video smart house, why not have sound in the front? I mean, and he's he's got literally a subwoofer and what four satellites? Clip I satellites. think so. Yeah, it's the yeah. smaller system, the 10 inch, With I think, no. or something like that. Yeah. So small is not mean small, though. I mean, it's still a pretty decent system. Um, and actually, I will say for those that are interested, um, so Klipsch, uh, I think it's Martin Logan. Uh, Origin Acoustics and Sonans all have very, very similar systems that are basically a 10 inch in ground subwoofer and four or eight satellites. They're all priced very similarly. They eight all or perform. 10, yeah. 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 
they're they're and they, and they they're all really, sound great. I say yeah, they are. They great. they're surprisingly good for what they are. Yeah. Shockingly, shockingly good. Like you can't believe how good they sound. And Gene's got one in the front, and, and he's got in the back. But you, you know what? Me, you might not use it all the time, but it's pretty cool to have sound in your in your house when you're coming up. It just kind of sets the stage for what you're coming into. You know what I mean? If you're entertaining, I don't, I don't know if you're going to convince party. me into doing that. I can't. <laughs> I don't think I want to tempt wow. fate and play it with my neighbors. It's all good, man. <laughs> so, I honestly think Gene just wanted me to show off his house some more. But I will give him the his his kitchen he did there is pretty cool. I actually hadn't seen that since it was done yet, and he sent me those mm -hmm. pictures. That that's a pretty neat style. Really cool. With. Yeah, I like yeah, that. it turned out nice. So he's got two on, on his outside when you go out from his family room into his covered lanai, which he's expanded on. Obviously, he's got two of the big Sonance Mariner eight inch, and those things. Have you heard those? I mean, Gene did he, a review. I haven't of heard them yet. They weren't hooked up. They're like a high end there. set of bookshelf speakers. Crazy how good they sound. Then you go out in the Gene's yard and in his landscaping around the back pointing in. And then he has the sub over to the right as you're stepping towards the back loaded against the wall. I mean, his yard sounds amazing. Even Gene, Gene called me. He's like, dude, I can't believe how good these sound. Cause you know, nobody's tougher on, on that than Gene. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's really, really cool. I, you got it kind of segmented in the different things, but the part in the middle there is where the subwoofer is loading against the wall of the house and it, it well that, that's why I, did. I wanted to be able to show everything here but yeah so there's i'm gonna get my little handy laser pointer out again so right over here is the subwoofer that's peeking sub, its head out and so you, yeah it's like it's not all that noticeable and then over here you can see these Got speakers like. and you can see there the, the one thing i don't love about the clips is they've got that track tricks waveguide that they're trying to hide in there. And so instead of having the round shape, it's a little bit more of a rectangular kind of angular shape to it. So it's a little more noticeable to me at least than the light yeah. ones, but they, it's the advantage bad. is they actually have pretty good output compared to other similar price ones. Like it's not going to mm -hmm. be as loud as the best stuff from uh, Ambisonics. We were talking about that'll probably play well, lower than these it's, clips. It's but totally it's, in a different price class. Exactly. Too. Massively different price class. I right, think the massive, Ambisonic yeah. stuff starts at 10 or 12,000. And I think that's for two satellites in the sun. Well, it's a different, I mean. Yeah, it's, it's a completely listen, different price class. I, I would be, Gene's, Gene's yard sounds amazing. This whole house sounds amazing. Let's just be honest. But that particular outdoor area, he had it screened in. What a great place to hang out with the family, entertain, have really good music. And you don't have to turn it up loud because you got speakers everywhere. Yep. That's the beauty and, of it. And that is one of the things about planning an outdoor space like this is that you're really, somebody had said this to me, um, it was actually Mike Sajeki. So he had said to me, that's a friend of Don and I, who um, is a he's, he's distributor. He's marketing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's with the marketing company. Product, product rep, thank you. That's the right name for it. So um, he and I were talking about the Sonan stuff and he was saying, you know, I would take two tens over a 12. He's, he said, I would take two eights over a 10, two tens over a 12, two twelves over a 15. He goes, really though, I would take four tens over a 15. And I said, really? Why? I don't, that doesn't make sense to me because indoors, that isn't necessarily always true. Like we do promote multi sub a lot, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to get a lot of deep base output, you often do need a big high output sub. It's why sure. Don, you have, well, if you're, you're Jay-Z, you know, <laughs> well, I'm just sure. saying, so we tend to do a lot of that kind of thing in our own system. So I was really thinking of doing, I wanted to do the Sonance 12 or the Ambisonics 12, um, or maybe even go with the 15 uh, in the ground. And I was looking at, I was going to spend some money to do that. And he said, I really wouldn't do that. I mean, it's a cool sub and all, but I, you'd be better off doing two subs than one big one. Now that cool. I've actually started playing around with this system, I get it. He's totally right. You're really better off spreading stuff all around your outdoor space mm -hmm. and just covering everything with sound than trying to put like two really high output, good speakers and one really good sub. It's sort of the opposite of what you typically do in a home where, where you really are often better off putting your money towards really good stuff than just a bunch of cheap stuff. In the outdoor space, not that you should totally cheap out, but you're probably better off buying smaller stuff, but more of it and putting it all around. I mean, you get what you pay for. You do. The landscape audio stuff has to withstand, you know, some pretty tremendous elements. A lot of, a lot of um, water, you know, a lot of moisture, a lot of guys cutting the lawn. So we always try to put the, the what we call donuts or like little concrete. Yeah, those concrete know, donuts. Degree, you put two of them together. Yeah. They, yeah. To cover them up. But um, they, they, there is a difference in build quality. I mean, 
certainly there, cheap stuff might sound okay for a while, but it's just not going to last. Well, some of it doesn't though. And that's, I think the other thing to keep in mind. So I was doing my homework a bit to try to understand what this cheap stuff is like. And I have some of it. I'm, we'll see if there's going to be a review for it or not, but I don't want to name names. So I will say that little Dayton audio subwoofer is actually really nice for the money. For, so for somebody who's got a budget of under $200 for a sub, that's worth it. And you're not going to be able to get anything like you that. You call me up. You're companies. like, dude, this thing sounds amazing. Like you, you were excited about it. I impressed. Uh, so we had, uh, Tom came over. So he's the rep for ambisonics and, and origin acoustics. He came over to, to do the ambisonics demo. He was impressed with it. I'm telling you, wait till you hear that thing. It's actually impressively good. Dude, Dayton um, audio makes, I mean, they make, they make decent good. stuff, but the value oh, is good. Man. But that, so that sub is good, but I have some other stuff, not from Dayton, but I won't name names for now. But I have some other stuff that I got in that is just cheap, commodity grade, I'll call it, outdoors stuff. It's basically stuff that they bought from China, brought here. I don't think that they had anything to do with the design. It's it, Versions sure. of it are sold by five or six different companies with different names on it. And it sounded very colored compared to the other stuff that I had here. When I measured it, it measured pretty poorly. And so I will just say that while none of the stuff that I've gotten my hands on yet has measured quite like a high-end speaker. And, and I actually am hoping, I mean, I haven't, keep in mind, I haven't measured the ambisonic stuff that may, and the James stuff I haven't measured either. It may too. But these other speakers, they just sounded significantly worse than the Sonans, the ambisonics and the other stuff that I've heard. So you're right. You get what you pay for. And some of that cheap stuff, really, it's not just that it won't last. I think it actually isn't as good sounding either. You know, you do get better sound by spending more. I, it's not obviously universally true. I have no idea the good and the bad yet. I haven't been able to hear enough of it, but I do know that I've identified some of the bad. And and so far, I'm yet to find a cheap outdoor speaker that I think doesn't sound colored. They all seem to have issues. Um, I have heard some really impressive, expensive stuff. It's just expensive. Yeah. It's, it rivals audiophile grade products in, in ways. So, yeah. you know, we work with Audality too through RBH and, and Audality is really working on coming out with some wireless high fidelity products, you know, cause they're able to transmit their wireless technology and high fidelity. So I'm excited to see what they come out with some, some really cool products because yeah. the, the caveat to all this, as you know, Matt, is you got to wire for it. That you, you do. And if you Gene's don't, out, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. We built Gene's house. We ran stub outs to the side. We built your house. We ran stub outs and that allowed you to do that. You know, most yeah. people can't do that, unfortunately. And I, I don't know what Gene ended up with, but I have three stub outs in my house um, yeah. on, on different sides of the house to allow me to do yeah, this. Three. One of them has a uh, Smurf tube in it so we can run whatever we need through that. So yeah, you're right. And you have to plan ahead. And so what happens when you're buying, for instance, you could be making your own home, building your own home, I should say. Um, but you're buying it from like a, just one of the kind of standard builders that, you know, are they're like machines sure. or factories are just putting the houses up. They don't tend to want to deal with this production stuff, so. builders. Yeah. Production builders. Well, thank you. Even they, even then they have options usually to have, you know, a, a, a low, an integrator or whoever or electrician wire some speakers outside. Sometimes I, mean, I got to say know. here in Sarasota in in either Palmer ranch or uh, for those who don't know, Palmer ranch is one of the areas where there's just a lot of land. So they tend to be doing a lot of these developments, uh, housing developments, they have a lot of builders there. A lot of those builders won't do this or they have a package, but it's really basic. So if you want to do stub outs and stuff, that's what they basically say is, yeah, when you get your house, you can do it on your own. And that's too late, which is one of the problems. So the, what, the idea behind wireless is you buy a house that, you know, it's already a built house or you're doing one of these production homes where they won't do it for you. It's not the end of the world. You may still be able to get some pretty good sound. Most of the wireless stuff isn't great. And some of the better stuff that's come out is based on airplay too. And then the problem is you got to have Wi-Fi outside. So, yeah, yeah. you know, if you didn't have wiring for speakers, what's the likelihood you had wiring to be able to do Wi-Fi? Yeah, outside? but I mean, everything that we do, we guide people in the wiring their house up. Well, you know, yeah. a good wiring. Not everybody well, has mean, done that. Well, not everybody's done that. So, but there is, there is hope. You can certainly retrofit wires in a lot of situations if you have a, a confident integrator to do it. Or, and there's some decent wireless pro products. Not a ton, but some decent ones. I actually just um, sent to some of my. Well, I'll just be kind of coy about it. To some of my contacts in the industry, a bunch of products that the product itself isn't there but the concept is really cool. And so uh, I sent it to them and said, you, you, you guys need to see if you can come up with something like this. That's the same concept, just higher fidelity. 
and all of them were very interested. So we'll see if some of these products come out. But I think the future may be something like you were describing with Audality, where it can be high fidelity wireless. Yep. Most people can run power outside, so low voltage for lighting. Yeah, or and all even that. rechargeable batteries. You know, decently. Well, there, you know, there are some solar batteries. systems. Yeah, there are some yeah. even that can yeah. they can use cool basically. Yeah, so I, I think that's a possibility, but I do think you're going to get better sound if you can at least run the low voltage wiring out there, which a lot of people have outdoor outlets. I mean, every house I've ever owned always had outdoor outlets, at least somewhere. So I suspect that if you couldn't run speaker wire, you could at least do that. And then the other thing that I've seen, which I think could be a cool idea, is a waterproof outdoor box. Mm -hmm. And then the amplifier goes in the waterproof outdoor box, and then you run your speaker wire up into that. However, I will say, as we found out with my stub outs, those waterproof outdoor boxes may not be totally waterproof. <laughs> well, yeah, it is what it is. So, you know, I wanted, we're getting into an hour now. I wanted everybody to know that we we are going to start doing our streams on a consistent basis now. We did, Matt built a house. I mean, he's got kids, a business. And we've been working on um, HD 2020, my former company, is now Haven Smart. And we've expanded and we have an office down by where Matt lives in Sarasota. We have one in Tampa and soon to have Orlando and some other areas. Um, but we've been super, super busy and we are working on some crazy, crazy cool projects like stuff that's world class. And, and Matt's Matt does all our acoustical design, our sound mitigation. He's one of the top guys in the world. And I know he's he it's a little weird when I tell you that, but Matt's amazing and you know, once we're able to talk about some of this stuff, we're going to really start putting it out some case studies and things that we've been working on. Uh, you know, we got some cool stuff, right, Matt? You know, we do. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'll just say my theater here, one of the things that happened once I decided to change the format of my company um, has become more of a demo space than, I mean, it is my theater, but it's a demo space to show what I can do. It's a sound mitigated room. Mm -hmm. um i've got actually need to do the video the whole video review of how i built the room there He's is some squishy, squishy floors squishy floors yeah i've got a floating squishy. floor in there which you can feel uh, i've got a door i mean don you've seen that door it's like two yeah, and a like half inches thick or pound, like that. Did somebody pounds. like smash a hand or something trying to get it up the stairs he's like the heaviest well, damn door in the planet when you say somebody smashed a hand about eight people got smashed as they tried yeah. to bring it up the stairs yeah it was didn't go well so i'll just anybody who has to do this i'll just tell you plan ahead yeah. leave a window out in your oh, upstairs yeah. and, and have it brought in with a crane oh. because our idea to carry it up the stairs was a stupid one but yeah. we did eventually get yeah. it up and we got it installed anyway you better never have a heart attack in that room nobody will hear you yeah i know probably <laughs> true so um, one of the things I'm hoping to do in there, somebody asked about acoustic treatments. So I sell acoustic treatments. It's part of what I do for people is design the spaces and, and identify what they need for acoustic treatments yeah. to make the room better. And so obviously my theater space needs to have them. Somebody asked if the family room I think had it. The answer is no. I would love to add some. I am trying to convince my wife to let me put in a uh, either a wall sculpture or, or a acoustic panel art print but so far i may have to just sneak it in the house and hope she likes it because she keeps saying no but the uh the theater room is going to have it and actually there's a new product from Arnovian. don i showed you yeah well That's we're going to use that so we're building it's, may i plug haven smart shamelessly so we just bought a building in sarasota and we're building um showroom or experience center and it's going to have like the, the baddest of the bad we're going to have a two a dedicated two channel sound room so who still does that? We do, right? Audioholics family does it. So we're going to have a dedicated two-channel sound room, fully acoustically treated, designed by Matthew Pose. But we're going to use this Art Novian product, and we're going to have just a kick your teeth in, every aspect considered, lighting, design, uh, sound, trend off driven. We're going to have a state-of-the-art theater that Matt's going to be designing with me uh, to put into that. So hopefully if you, any of you are in central Florida, when we get that, we should be, we should be opening around October of this year or something like that. It'd be great to have some people come in. Exactly. So we've run we're going to have that and that's going to be one that's going to be open. People can come in whenever they want, check yeah. that out, see what you can do with it. My own theater, same concept, actually same equipment, basically probably yeah. a different finish. Like there's different versions of this new art. Sure. So basically the way it works is it's modular, which is what makes it so cool. You've got bass traps, diffusers, and absorbers. It's a 24 got, by 24 yeah. frame that mounts to a wall. Then what you put in that frame, you have a multitude of choices from diffusive, the absorber, 
bass trap yeah. or open for a speaker. It's really, right. it's an amazing product, man. I'm super excited. And then excited there's a front and the front can be fabric. It yeah. can be wood. It can be right. painted. It, there's different finishes. So I'm sure we're going to do one kind of finish for you. I'm going to probably do a different finish. So my room is going to be, I keep calling it noir. I don't know if that's quite the right word for it, but it's a black room, black velvet and, and black walnut. The black walnut is not actually black, but walnut basically on the panel. So that's going to be the look of the room. Kind my chairs gothic, are black. Kind of gothic, man. <laughs> there you go. Gothic room. It's going to be dark for sure, but I think it's going to be really cool when it's done. And then I don't think we're doing something anywhere near that dark for your room. I think we're doing something uh, for the, for the, Hey, oh, for our theater, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to do, I mean, it's going to be super contemporary. We're going to have um, a lot of really cool RGBW lighting by Color Beam. So it's going to have some crazy, almost sci borderline sci-fi sci look to it. I think we might just do run one row of seats in it, too, because of the size. Probably going to do a two two four zero screen, um, all active speakers in it, four 18-inch subwoofers. Ooh, I can't wait. <laughs> It's going to be very cool for sure. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of spaces there. So there's going to be a lot of different types of experience, mm -hmm. but the theater room, because that's what I love doing is going to be definitely yeah. a passion project. So that'll be neat. Oh, for sure. and, and we can cover a hundred percent of that, which is neat. You know, like we were talking about, we have these uh, non-disclosure agreements on a lot of the projects we work on that don't allow us to show pictures or name names, or sometimes even talk about anything beyond we're working on something. But with this one, we can bring our cameras in there. We can record yeah. the whole thing. Um, I did a little bit with my space, but it was it was hard to capture it all. I, some of your poor installers I have sitting on the floor with bundles of wire around them, and I was putting them into a video review recently, and I was like, I don't know if this is really that flattering. <laughs> yeah, well, it is what it is. So we're going to talk, I think next week, we're going to talk a little bit about a theater that Matt's going to be helping me doing the calibration. It's one of the top five biggest homes in America. It, it, I don't know where it lies, but it's in the top. I think number three, it's massive. And we just did a absolutely kick-ass theater in it with a 200 inch, di 200 inch diagonal 16 by nine screen. Cause that's what the client wanted. It, it's, it's really cool. And it's, I've seen the pictures. I actually haven't been on site yet. I will be for the, obviously mm -hmm. for doing the calibration, mm -hmm. but um, you and I have been talking about that since mm -hmm. it was basically the studs. I mean, since you were getting sure. started with the project and I know, I think this is worth stating and we'll get into this when we do our next video, but I think a lot of people assume when they hear about a project like that, where there could be a million dollars spent on the room, that it's that not, must mean that it's no. cost, no object, and you can do whatever no. you want. The reality cost is, is always an object. <laughs> what, yeah. Cost is always an object. And the reality is when you scale up a room like that, everything gets more expensive. The projector, for instance, ends up being a huge part of the total expense of the room because you can't use a normal projector. Now you need a projector. $88,000 do... is what we demoed the other day. Yeah, the and sun, it's what ten thousand lumens for that one. Ten thousand, yeah, with the two twenty power, it's ten thousand ANSI lumens. And let me tell you, but you it need made that for a, it made a two hundred. It made a two hundred inch screen look like a damn TV, dude. That Sony three eighty projector is the bomb. I mean, it's massive, and you need power to it. But let me tell you something. It it it's one of the finest projectors I've ever seen in my life. It's stunning how good yeah. it is. So, so my point being, when you're you're doing this, you've got. The, the, the interior designer actually often dominates your decisions. And that's something I think people don't always understand. So they're going to have a certain look that they're going for. And you've got to work with them. You can't override them for good sound. You need to actually achieve good sound, not in spite of them, but really in partnership with them. And so they're going to tell you things they want to do and how they want to do it. There's a, a way that they want the panels, for instance, built sure. to get the look they want. There's a fabric they want to use. And one of the other projects they're working on I mean, at this point, I think I've purchased and submitted 70 different fabrics to try to get one that the interior designer is going to be okay with that will meet everybody's needs. Oh, I God. Still yeah. don't know if we've got it. Yeah, that one's crazy. But 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 interior designers, are many of them are just badass, dude. They're Absolutely. really great at what they do. And if, if you find the right one and you have a conversation with them and you win them over so they understand that, you know, we can have a compromise on aesthetics and performance, then that's really when you get that synergistic, uh, you know, relationship and, and you make some magic. But I, I, yes, you do have to work with interior designers and they are pretty much goddesses or gods on the job site, but you know, they, but they, they do amazing stuff. So we, we really have gotten good with working with them. And you know that Matt, I mean, absolutely. You know, 
mean, I've worked with three or four now in Florida alone on projects. But anyway, the point I was going to make was when you see this room, you're going to see things that you might think are a compromise. And, I, and they are technically, but this room is awesome. You've, I haven't heard it yet, but you've told me it sounds awesome. And I trust your, your ears. Pretty well, I was worried about, I had four jail audio subs, you know, cause we had to use in wall subs. We had absolutely no choice and we had to put them in the front of the room. So I, I put two pair on each corner to load them out and it's a big room. And I got to tell you those, those jail audios absolutely hammer. They sound great. I mean, is it, you know, JTR 418s loud? No, but it's, for any reasonable person and it's tight and it's accurate and it's plenty of bass, especially with two tiered platforms. Cause that just, you know, takes an accent, accentuates that base, you know? Yeah. So I think, and that's the thing that I think people need to, to kind of keep in mind is that these systems sound, even with the compromises we made, they often sound way better than they ought to way better than you think they would. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's just how it works. I mean, we're working on another one where we're custom making speakers, where everything is being <laughs> specially done to make this the best it can possibly be. And yet it everything. is still loaded. And there's a lot of money going into the room too, but it is still loaded with compromises because I mean, this is not, I won't get into all the details for this, but like we've done a bunch of multi-purpose rooms that inevitably the moment it has to serve more than one purpose, the room has compromises. That's a reality. Right. I, I, I get sick of people coming on YouTube and all that and telling you how you must do this and you have to do this. You don't have to, man. There's, you don't There's have ways to have of getting really good position at most speakers. It's not going to be the end of the world. Cause you're going to hear them reflect that. Uh, never mind. I'm not, it's not <laughs> I, know, I know what you're getting into. Look, yeah. I, I do consulting with clients sometimes. And I, I had one guy once and he, he was just a stickler for details, which is great. It actually is a, an important quality to have. And, and a lot of things, with audio, a lot of those details actually don't matter as much as people yeah, think. So in this really case, don't. we were like working out the math. And I, I basically had used a piece of software that automatically calculated the location for the Atmos speakers. And I gave it to him. And I, But I showed him how it came to those conclusions and why. And he came back and he was like, shouldn't they really be? And he had like a different location and a rationale for it. And it was based on kind of like his interpretation of the Dolby mm -hmm. paper. And I said, well, that's not really what they mean. The, for those who aren't aware, the concept that Dolby uses to develop where these things are supposed to go is based on a hemisphere. And so the Atmos speakers are sitting up in the top of a hemisphere, basically. And the left, center, right, and all the base channel surrounds are sitting around the periphery of the hemisphere around you. So he was moving around. I said, look, I guarantee you that if we used your location or my location, you'd never hear a difference. It doesn't really matter. And, it really and, doesn't. And these, no. these, these people that come on youtube and tell you that you got to do it this way dude i i would kiss their ass if they could close their eyes blindfold them and put two in two or three different rooms and, and tell me which one sounds better i mean it's just the truth i don't give a shit what they say i've done more theaters than any of them and and it just it just does not that important i mean you can as long as you're you know you want to be reasonable about it right matt yeah. i mean we're not but you just, I'm not promoting right. putting them completely in the wrong of course, location. Right, right. I'm just right. saying that there's a wide range of acceptable. And even if you fall a little bit outside of that wide range of acceptable, it's still probably going to be okay. Um, so anyway, uh, somebody had asked a Sorry. question. I'll just mention this because it comes sure. up a lot. And then we probably need mm -hmm. to end this because we, we need to sleep. Sure. So the question is, is it worth it to soundproof the room? Um, and then it says something about drawing on the electric dedicated line. So I'm going to in interpret, I think, what what's being said here. Um, so soundproofing a room is something that's really done for two reasons. One is to keep outside sound from coming in. And so the idea there would be, you're just somebody who's so passionate mm -hmm. about excellent sound that you want the best dynamic range. And you don't want your music or movies being interrupted by the sound of people outside, cars driving by, things like that. So that's one reason it's done. That's actually a very expensive thing to to fix because a lot of the sources of noise that you get in the room are HVAC related and low frequency noise, which can be HVAC, but it can be any number of other things, pumps. It can be things outside, transformers, course, you name it. Like when I put my victims, I, I don't want them hearing cops outside. Exactly. Right. right. So I that's a very them. expensive thing to, to, do, to address. And I just want to warn people that that, you know, if that's where you're at, I mean, you can do some soundproofing, you can address some of it, but once you start to get into the HVAC and the low frequency rumbling noises, it starts to get expensive quick. Um, having a contractor do it for you. I mean, I've just, I've priced out a bunch of these recently for clients. You're looking at well over a hundred thousand dollars in additional costs in a room potentially to do this. 
Now, the other reason it's done, and this can change the calculus a little, is to keep the sound in. So in other words, you don't want people outside the room to hear your theater. And that's, that's actually my motivation. That's the majority, yeah. Yeah, that's the what majority. most people want. And so my wife, you know, she's she's fine with me spending the money within reason. She's fine with me having the stuff because she knows that it's something that brings me joy. But she's not fine with me watching movies, you know, full tilt, shaking the whole house. I mean, she makes jokes about it. She used to work over my old theater, which was soundproof, but we didn't necessarily do the best of jobs doing vibration isolation. So even though it was like a room within a room, I had four 18s. <laughs> And so she was sitting on a desk that was sitting directly over the theater and it would, she couldn't hear anything, but it was shaking the desk. Like, like literally like the desk was doing this and she'd come down and get, what are you doing? The desk was jumping up and down. And I'm like, sorry. Four so, will test the structural integrity of your damn home. Yeah. I, so I'll just mention for those who are curious, if it's even possible to isolate against that, essentially what you need to do is add a ton of mass and you need to have the inner room decoupled, not by just those little rubber isolators, but using spring decouplers, because the amount of vibrational movement, if you will, that's happening from something like 418s or basically a lot of high output subwoofers is in the inches, not millimeters. And those little rubber isolators only have a few millimeters uh, of travel. So you have to use something pretty serious. Point being, it gets really, really expensive to do that. But you can do a modest amount of sound mitigation where you can, you're not going to stop all the sound, but you can get it to a point where it's tolerable to people outside the room at more reasonable prices. Now, having said that, it's still, again, having somebody do the work for you, you're probably looking at about three to four thousand dollars from the drywall side for the yeah, extra layer of drywall and finishing. Yeah. yeah. The, the isolators, you could be looking at a thousand dollars in isolators. You could be looking at about two thousand dollars in labor. I would guess you'd be spending about ten thousand dollars just to do like the lowest level of sound isolation in a room and that's assuming that it's at the stud level you know if you if you then have to get into ripping out old drywall adding insulation things like that it, it, it may be fifteen thousand dollars so it's not nothing but here's what i would say about that whether it's worth it or not is up to you it depends on how important those two factors i was telling you about keeping outside sound out and inside sound in um at what that's worth but a lot of people spend fifteen thousand dollars on accessories for their sound systems that make a far less difference than mm -hmm. sound mitigation would but if the things that i was mentioning it's good for are not that important to you i would actually spend that fifteen thousand dollars on acoustic treatments first that to me that's more worth yeah it. well i mean most houses rattle real bad so mike's asking about power just real quick mike not to dwell on it when we do a system in a home at the bare minimum, we ask for a dedicated 20 amp circuit. We like to have two dedicated 20 yeah. amp circuits. And if it's a system like some of these premier jobs that we're doing, we even we even do 220 so that we have um, a lot of these amplifiers really and subwoofer amps and amplifiers really only reach their spec power with with that much power coming into it. So yeah, the Neutronov 16 channel amp will only reach its full spec power uh, with a with a 220 line. And that's yep. just because you can do it with 240, amp, yeah. really. Yeah, you can do a 240 with with um, 20 amps and it gives you it's like whatever that ends up being what 4800 class D is really like that that wall power coming out. Yeah. So typically, even though you're technically able to get about 4800 watts out of that kind of a circuit, the amps tend to not be able to do much more than about I would say 3,500 to 4,000 watts would be even on that line maxed out on a 120 line with 20 amps. You're really not going to see more than about uh, 2,200 watts or so is kind of the max of what you typically get out of them. And so that same amp, it's the exact same amp, same power supply. It's a universal power supply. You plug it into a 120, you get, I think it is 2,200 or 2,400 watts. You plug it into the, the 220, 240 and you're going to get uh, I think it's 3,200 watts out of that amp right. total. It's all the channels combined. It's like and that so, some projector with it's only 4,000 ANSI lumens on a, on a 120, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. but 10,000 on a 220. Yeah, 10, the, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, Hey, so, let's let everybody know. We got Jeff coming from JTR and RTJ speakers. I know he's, he's a pretty popular guy. He's coming into town soon. Maybe we'll have the, we'll have him on. What if we can get him on a live week? stream? Yeah, he's kind of shy, but we should see. If we well, can he's going to stay with me for a couple of days. Then he's going to come down and stay, well, hang out with you, stay with you. So he's bringing his whole clan down. That's one of the good guys in the industry. If you, you don't know JTR and RTJ speakers. 
He is. He's a, he's somebody who I consider a friend in this industry. I mean, a real friend, not like a friend, like somebody I know. No, he's a good friend industry, of ours. But both of yeah. ours. I introduced friend. him to you guys, I think, originally, but he's somebody I've, I've known and loved. He's just a good guy. I mean, forget what he does for the from a speaker standpoint, all that. He's, he's just a, a good, good, good human being. Solid. Got red-blooded American dude, man. He's awesome. Hey, Alex is talking about us talking about the JBL synthesis in walls. Um, Alex, I've actually heard those at a show. Um, they're pretty impressive if you like that particular sound. Um, the Focal 1000 series, we've got a couple of those being installed here right now as we speak. Um, that's a pretty damn impressive speaker system. I know a lot of the influencers, a lot of people out there are jumping on that that Focal 1000 series. I mean, probably JBL is going to be maybe a little bit more dynamic, but I think the Focal is going to just take the day every, all day long with sound quality as far as mu musicality. The, the JBL stuff I know has um, waveguides and they put a lot into directivity control. So in situations where you can really take advantage or benefit from the, the way that they've done that for directivity, I mean, especially the MTM one that they have has right. pretty good um, vertical directivity control because of that design. But I will say I was, I've always felt this way about the JBLs. They measure really well. They always sound really bright. <laughs> So I, I find myself always, but little bit, it's little fixable. Bit yeah, little, little but it bright. is fixable. You can, especially with yeah. that type of equipment, you're often hugging up. Well, that's any compression. Well, except yours that I've yet to hear. So you keep telling I me about it. you'll be that. impressed, yeah. Right. Well, a lot of it has to do with, I think, the, the directivity index. I think mm -hmm. when it's really raised like that, mm -hmm. uh, but you've got like a really smooth, even response off axis, I think for whatever reason the speaker tends to sound a bit bright and there's some benefit actually uh, putting in a, i need some water hold on so alex there was a time when most of the theaters that i did were jbl synthesis systems just because it was just a no-brainer i mean literally it, it was just easy you know the, the processing the control it was a complete system um you know i always thought they were a little bit bright i hate to use the word bright maybe a little bit too forward and neutral for my liking. Um, but that's a personal preference. I know a lot of people love horns. A lot of people love JBL and, and Klipsch. Um, but I tell you, this new Focal system, its they, they really did a good job on it. It's a kick, kick butt system, especially the Utopias, if you use those in a theater. So I really want to check out their that subwoofer module they make that adds on where you've got oh, like the core speaker one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that thing looks kind of interesting. Yeah, so the other thing I... Them. The other thing that we forgot to mention, and I just want to uh, bring this up, so we it's not a guarantee, but I'm going to say it because maybe it'll get back to Harmon and they'll follow up on our email. Oh, but we, we've talked about trying to bring in some more different types of outdoor sound stuff. And mm -hmm. Harmon through uh, Ravel actually has a pretty cool lineup of outdoor stuff. And they put a lot of good engineering into their speakers. And from what I can tell, a lot of their outdoor speakers appear to be versions of their indoor speakers just designed to be outside and so they've got a lot of the same good engineering yes, so we've I, I asked them Rebels. i dig revel speakers me too i think to they, they sound good and they often actually really good for the money when you start to look across all the other available options they're not necessarily that expensive compared to what some similar other products would be but they they perform better so we've asked them they have a tower speaker basically it's a bollard style with a light We've asked them if they'd send us a set of those, and I want to check them out here. I think they look pretty cool. I think it's a neat form factor, and uh, the driver array uh, it appears to be like an MTM with four four-inch drivers and a, and a one-inch aluminum dome tweeter or something like that. And uh, so I'm kind of hoping we can do you know a pair of those, check them out. They have a 12-inch sub. We asked about that too, so we'll see if we can get them to send that. So, Harmon, if you're listening, please send it our way. We really want to review that. We think it looks pretty cool. Yeah. It's a beautiful speaker, man. It, it it is. It looks like this, uh, you know, something you would have in an outdoor area. You would never even notice it. So I'm sure it's amazing. Listen, there's a lot of great products for outdoor audio. And if you guys have questions or trying to design or put an out, outdoor audio system together, hit us up. Either, you know, email Matt or myself at ddunn at havensmart.com. And we can, if we can't reach you where you're at, we can at least advise you on what to get. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we can do some stuff um, uh, remotely. The audio Advisors has they can they can sell products wherever, right? That Gene's working with. 
Oh yeah, yes, they can. And then there's certain lines. Oops, there's certain lines that I could potentially sell anywhere in the country. Other lines, though, you and I both would only be able to sell within our region, which is sure, Florida. Sure. Um, but you know, I'm happy to look at some designs at others. But I actually am working with somebody who's got an integrator that's doing everything for him. And then the integrator and I are working together. And the integrator basically is coming up with a design for the guy. He sends it to me. I go through and make some changes to it and suggest and so some suggestions that goes back to the integrator. So, I mean, that's something we can do. And then I haven't really thought about this, but, you know, I've, I've seen this done before. I think it'd be kind of cool if somebody submitted a project and we kind of reviewed it good and bad yeah. live on a show like this to kind of show. Well, you know, we're getting you ready. We're getting ready to do a probably a hundred thousand dollar outdoor audio system for one of my long term clients. Um, so. As, once we sign that and get that finalized, we can shoot drone footage and he's all about it. Maybe we can do that and show everybody what he's doing. You know what I mean? That'd be super cool. If, if people want to, we're just trying to bring stuff that's just not the norm, you know, reviewing a pair of bookshelves or comparing powered monitors or a set of towers. We're trying to just show you what you can do and what integrators, I, I don't care where you live. You're probably pretty close to a CD integrator. And there's some very talented, amazing guys out there that can help you out. Yeah, you're going to pay a little money for their advice and their work. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, it's worth doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've enjoyed my experience working with your team. Um, and obviously, I know what I'm doing in a lot of ways. But there's, I think there's two pieces to it. One is I'm busy. I have two kids. One of them is two years old. The other seven. Mm -hmm. I have, as you said, I have my own company. I have a day job outside of that company. Um, I am actually one of, the, I, I, like you said, my wife takes care of the kids. My wife works at night, so I'm the one who takes care of the kids. Yeah, you take care of the school. Cooks and takes care of the kids. Gene, so. Gene calls me a good wife all the time. Um, so, you know, having somebody else that can do a lot of the stuff, it's like, can I do it? Sure. Do I want to do it? No. And then the other part of it is that I know a lot about certain aspects of this industry. I don't know everything. And I definitely don't know a lot about stuff that relates to a lot of this custom integration stuff, multi-zone audio, even outdoor. I mean, it's like, but you're learning physics. How? Sure. I am. Thank you. Um, but it's been good to work with your guys and kind of learn how that stuff is done. I mean, there were some things they were doing where I didn't get it and it turned out right. that they really were right. It was the right way to do it. It's right. how it's done in the industry. And so working with an integrator can actually, in some cases, it costs you money, but it can save you money because they're doing it the right way. Yeah. And you don't have to, go through 10,000 different views on online. So maybe we should call this the, instead of tech talk with Don and Matt tech talk with the PhD and the redneck. You know what I mean? <laughs> we could do that. One we thing I'll also that. mention is um, I, when I was growing up, I used to like to read like motor trend and car and driver and the different car magazines. And the thing is I didn't really like reading about the Camry or the civic. I liked reading about the Ferrari or the oh, yeah. Royce or the Bentley because I knew I can't afford them. I never can afford them, but they were cool and it was neat to read about what they could do. And in audio, there used to be, some of them are still around, but there used to be these magazines that really specialized more in ultra high end home theater. And I loved reading them because it was always this type of custom integrator stuff. And it was like, I didn't right. know this world existed. And then I'm getting to see this world and look at it. And it's like, this is like the Ferrari of home. A lot stuff. of people don't though. That's kind of, my whole deal working with Gene is I wanted to bring our industry, not uh, not just us, but all the amazingly talented integrators out there. Man. I mean, there's there's some guys and gals out there that are that are building magic. And, you know, people don't know that we're even out there. It's like, the, what's the hardest question to ask an integrator? Hey, what do you do for a living? They're like, all right, you got a minute? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I just tell people I sell TVs, you know? Um, <laughs> Because we do motorized shades, we do um, low voltage or high voltage lighting systems with circadian rhythm. We we control water. I think, leaks you, I think you had it right the first time. You do low voltage. Exactly That's right. right. <laughs> Need electrician to do the, the high voltage. But yeah, the point is. More. Homes are changing so much anymore. I mean, that's your, your guys end up any, they need to be like IT guys, you know, they're, they're they installing Wi-Fi, but they're managing yeah. those systems too. everything they through do. like oversee is done remotely. So you're managing all these systems. These guys need to know how to do coding, scripting. They need to understand a million different products, which is a challenge. I mean, I sometimes have to educate them and this is reasonable. It's I'm not picking up them. There's so many different versions of technology out there. It's hard to keep up with it. Even we always when you work learn. In the industry. We're always learning. But we do stuff like when we do a full system, if you call in, you know, you, your three glasses of bourbon in or wine and you're like, hey, my audio's not working. 
we can pull it up on a computer, see what's going on, hit a button from a hundred miles away and, and do a reboot on a system. And it pops yep. back on and starts working again. I mean, we do, there's some cool stuff we do, man. I actually need to put in more of the oversea uh, power controllers in my house. Cause mm -hmm. I have to reboot a bunch of the things all the time and I have to do it manually and I'm running between the different rooms. But the neat thing with these new systems is yeah, you can just hop on the computer, log into it and reboot it that way. Yeah. It's, it's the oversea ecosystem has really changed our company and how we design it. Cause we, we don't just try to get the sale. We try to look through to, after the sale with our clients that's the most important part pushing past you know six months a year year and a half because that's when we get referrals and how we we feed our family so overseas allowed us to do instead of rolling a truck when there's a problem on friday night and not getting there till monday we're able to address problems in real time as they happen and do reboot so you know the dude's not trying to hold his drink and go to his rack and trying to figure out what product to reboot. We can actually do it remotely. So there we're doing Josh AI now, which is basically a Lexon steroids. It's an artificial learning system that as you use it, the more you use it, the more it learns on your habits, your voice patterns. Um, and it doesn't monitor you, <laughs> which is really cool. <laughs> it's so, a cool system. Uh, I was just reading up on it. Cause I, I just became a, uh, snap one dealer myself and so that's one mm -hmm. of the products they they mm -hmm. specialize in and just for those who are curious think of it as alexa in many many ways it is it has a lot of advantages over alexa including it doesn't record and monitor and sell your information well, right for, right yeah. but the the one of the issues with the alexa stuff is that you end up having to get these it, either you're putting little pucks around your house or you have to buy these specialized products to hide the pucks the josh ai system was designed with integrators in mind in the first place so the accessories that go with it allow you to actually build it into walls and it looks oh yeah really we've cool. got we're putting so we're building the haven smart ultimate smart home and it, it's going to be the most technologically advanced house in the country we've got everything every single discipline we do from motorized shades to motorized screens to low voltage led lighting with circadian rhythm and and battery backup but the josh ai is really great because it's a it's the size of a quarter and it flushes into a wall and we've got a couple different versions of it. The one that flushes into a wall, when you talk to it, it goes to the distributed audio and then the sound comes out of the speakers, which is really freaking cool. And th the other one, when we put in rooms that have surround systems, you have an, an AV preamp, a pre pro um, processor or receiver that has to turn on, has to turn to the right input. So there's a little bit of time, you don't want to say, Hey, Josh, blah, 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 blah. Then, you know, uh, dun, dun, wait for it. So we've got ones that actually have speakers built into them in those areas. So it, it's a super cool, man. I'm excited because it's been my baby and my pet project. It's my boss's house, but we're going to use it to show certain clients. They want to come and enjoy it, have a glass of wine and experience what it's like to actually list, live in a, a state-of-the-art home. I mean, he's going to do the 100-inch Sony TV in the family room with a Leon soundbar that a $12,000 soundbar with CIs and Morel drivers, jail audio subs, all hidden. I mean, it's just cool. I can't wait. We're going to, we're going to do some, some, some footage and sorry, I don't mean to drag, man. I'm just excited. It's what I do. <laughs> it, it sounds really cool. I've actually not seen that house yet either, but I know you've invited me over, so I do need to check it out if that's uh, okay. At some we're point. doing a battery backup called the Rosewater system. And that battery backup is going to its own, um, panel with smart circuit breakers that we can monitor and and that circuit breaker only goes to the equipment racks the lighting anything with a microprocessor in it and it's all battery backed up surge protected but fil filtered so everything has a really constant super clean form of power going to it so I, anyways i'll I could go on for hours. We can do another show on this. It's fine. We we do need to probably put this show to, yeah. to rest. People yeah. need to go to bed. So I just want to say, I we haven't done this in so long. I was trying to remember how we end these shows. <laughs> so I think we're supposed to say keep listening, right? So anyway, yeah, Don, it's been great. We're going to, yeah, keep doing awesome. these. I think hopefully people join us in the future to hear. We'll try to have more targeted topics in the future. We just, the patio thing was exciting. We thought. You know, Haven Smart and, and Matt, our services are, are out there for, for sure. Um, you know, we, we, we try to bring a lot to the table, audioholics. I got to give Gene all the credit in the world for really, uh, self-cleaning carpets, right? Come on. Yeah, we don't have that, um, <laughs> but we're, we're really trying to give 
um, besides just your typical audio review of products and amplifiers and tests and specs, but try to bring some different aspects of the industry. Hell, we're even doing live streams with musicians. I mean, we're, we're, we're really trying to bring more. So if you guys have suggestions for us, please, we're all ears. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. This has been great. And until next time, keep listening. Keep listening. Don't pick your nose, Matt. You're still on. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're kind of boring. We're like, wah, wah, wah. I need to drink more bourbon. It says it's still going. Come on. Come on.